This is Cursed Earth Radio. Hello, Dark Judges, Desperados, and dudes in dick shaped helmets. You're listening to Cursed Earth Radio, the one and only podcast bringing dread to the dreadless. Broadcasting outside the walls of Mega City One across the Black Atlantic in North America. I'm Cool Johnny Cool. And this is Heavy Metal Kid, and today we're bringing one of our war buds to discuss the story, also known as War Buds. And we're going to talk about Fleetway Quality. I know uh, you're going to love that, HMK. Fleetway Quality, my friend, is an oxymoron. I don't think it exists. I hate you. <laughs> and now we just wait for yeah. the explosion as it ticks. Are we going to say we li- you're listening to Cursed Earth Radio? Oh yeah, you're listening to Cursed Earth Radio. Keep listening, creeps. So, only, we only have, minimal damage this week. Yeah, we did like four uh, tries at our intro, which is scaled down from the usual twenty. <laughs> no so problem. We're, we're, we're already ahead of the curve. We're going to discuss <laughs> today war buds. We are with and our war bud. With our war bud, Rick. Say hello, Rick. Hey, what's up, Dreaded? We. Uh, I found out about war buds from eating a Chinese food with Rick. We eat Chinese food. Uh, ooh, we eat Chinese food weekly. And uh, at our weekly Chinese dread discussions. Well, that's how we roll here in the Cursed Earth, because there's like 12 of us. And yeah. we're fortunate enough now to have three of us in yeah. the same geographical location. When you meet another person that likes Judge Dredd, you should probably get that person's name and phone number. Latch on like a lamprey. That's true. And we kind of messed that up last week. We were we actually what, met a couple guys <laughs> at that Chinese restaurant who like Judge Dredd. Yeah, and the guy was like, oh, that's a, that's a cool Dredd tattoo. And then... Oh, you like Judge Dredd, and we had a little discussion. Look at you making friends. I know. But then I, we didn't get the dude's name or anything, so... <laughs> he went back to Wyoming yeah, or whatever. The grill's right. too good. I'm not I'm not good at, at really that social element. Join the club, I just which is odd for our Trojan occupations. I know. I just don't feel comfortable just talking to random people. Right? Because, you know, what, what if you start to initiate that Dredd conversation, and it turns out that <laughs> he's talking about... Uh, Sylvester Stallone. Well, which is right. obvious, often the case here in the Cursed Earth. Yeah. Uh, you can always tell when someone's testing the water because they go, what'd you think of the 2012 movie? Oh, you mean the good one? Yeah. And then you're like, well, they know about the 2012 yeah. movie. So that's that's pretty good right there. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a hard life. And we've said it a million times being a Dread fan over here in the Cursed Earth. It's The pickings are slim and the friends are few and far between. And that's why when we, we find someone else who likes Dread, like our friend Rick here... We actually want to sort of put them on display and interview them as if they're a freak of nature. Because here in the Cursed Earth, they kind of are. Definitely. And I, you know, Rick and I talked to Ed for hours last night in the the cold at a show. So uh, we we ramped up for today. You were rehearsing for today's interview. You know me, man. If you get me near somebody that likes Dread, I ain't going to shut up about it. That's true. (laughs) So, Rick... What's tell up? us, uh, tell us how you found Judge Dredd in 2000 AD comics. Uh, well, about 80, 88, 89, 90, uh, I was getting, of course, I was always a big Conan the Barbarian fan, and um, and I would get my materials from SQ Productions from Tom's River, New Jersey, uh, and they would send these catalogs with my ores. I'd get like these Conan portfolios. And they would send me these free items like Judge Dread pins, badges, oh. and then they'd send you the fleet quality. See, fleetway quality. <laughs> and at that time, they were one of the main uh, importers bringing in Judge Dread. I mean, you ah. couldn't find them. You could not. I mean, we really didn't even have any comic book shops in West and where I come from. And then, uh, you, even if you did happen to find a comic shop, they didn't even know what Judge Dread was. And, and let's let's face it. Like, and, and I'm not I, I'm not really ripping on Fleetway quality. I know you, <laughs> you love. You think it's ridiculous. But probably what was happening was the uh, SQ production was going. Oh, these fucking things aren't selling. Let's just go see. This guy likes Conan. Maybe he'll like Dread. And so he was probably sending them out because no one was reading them. I mean, why? It's sad. Why? It's sad. Why do you have to hurt me? Real quick deviation. Speaking of dread pins, they sent you. Uh, uh, John, cool Johnny, cool bought me a Judge Fire pin. Uh, yeah, since that's awesome. we argue about my love for <laughs> Judge Fire. All right, continue on. So SQ Productions was sending you these free dread comics. Yeah, and at first I just kind of flipped through them. I liked the artwork, and then uh, to me, it kind of came off like a RoboCop ripoff. Oh, the creep! Uh. Yeah, coming to creep, creep, and I'm like. This is nothing but a damn uh, RoboCop ripoff. And then, 
And that's when I finally got internet access later on. It's like, uh, after you study the history of Judge Dredd, and you're like, no, it was really the other way around. Yeah. So uh, it was, and then it made me look at it a completely different perspective. I, so really, I started getting more hardcore about mid late 90s. I just kind of like read. Really, I think what it was was Simon Bisley. Because I was getting Conan the Barbarian, he was known for the work, and they were sending me a lot of his stuff and mm-hmm. pictures. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't even get free prints and art or anything of Dredd. Just they were trying to get rid of it. What I, I had armloads of that. stuff. <laughs> I, I even had a convention T-shirt of Judge Dredd on it, and I actually seen this on eBay a, a month ago, going for hundred bucks. God. What I would have done to, for free to get like that kind of access to Dredd because yeah. turns like Rick and I kind of got yeah. in at the same place, like yes. ni- early late eighties, early nineties. That's yeah. where I jumped yeah. in. And we were on what like doing the same thing because yeah. I was paying for my fleet ways and he got a hook up when he's getting them for free. Yep. What I wouldn't have given for that. How many people do you think uh, thought back then and still think today that Judge Dredd is a ripoff of Robocop? So many. I don't I was talking to Rick about this last night. I don't I don't get it. Like I it, it's it's not even remotely the same thing. I mean they're both Law enforcement individuals. That's all people need because they don't yeah. do. They don't Murphy's delve any a further. Cyborg and Dread. Is Dread Dread's Dread. kind of a cyborg now. He's got robot eyes. <laughs> but he is. like, so uh, I I have a friend, uh, an ex bandmate, who will message me, and he always calls Dread Robocop because he knows that that, that mm, irritates I was me. Pushing your buttons. So he messaged me the other day and he said, uh, "Who would win in a fight, Dread or Robocop?" And I knew what he was doing, and I said, "Ha ha, trick question, same guy, right?" And he was like, "Fuck you." Like, yep, <laughs> get out of here. Heard it all before. Yeah, I, I just don't get the comparison. It's just so it vaguely on the surface. I mean, you know, but there is footage, I think, on the uh, Future Shock uh, DVD where they're talking about when Robocop was being made, uh-huh. the the like previews of what it was going to look like before they redesigned Robocop had the fucking dick helmet. It was oh, did it? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. You've never seen the photos. I, I have not. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But, like, seen, yeah. Robocop is basically a modern Frankenstein story. Right. It's right. in... Um, Verhoeven didn't want to direct it, and his wife convinced him to direct it because she said it's the Christ story in three acts. You know, oh, wow. yeah. he is, he is, and then he is sacrificed and he is resurrected. And no, you know, no fault of Paul Verhoeven. I mean, I, I don't think. No. But here, I've I've pulled up a, a photo, and you can type this <coughs> in, listener, and see this is fucking RoboCop. Yeah, that's the Judge Dredd helmet. It's one hundred percent the Judge Dredd helmet, and I don't understand how how they even. That it's is a complete copy. I don't understand. Yeah, that's yeah. Robocop. Yeah, that's, that's like a preliminary. Me. What was it like a concept or something? Yeah, when look they were the, the helmet's the got the, the shield on, and I have never. You and, know me. I mean, look at the face. Yeah, it's got the dread scout. I don't know what the fuck's going on. And here. you know it's me. Terrible. I'm a huge Robocop fan, and I have never seen that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think a lot of people have mistaken that. So I'm glad that you started reading. Instead of just saying, "Oh, it's just a rip off Robocop character," because you wouldn't be here today, right? <laughs> that's right. So, of those stories that you discovered, that you were sent, what what were some of the ones that that made you decide that you were going to keep reading this? Well, Dread by Bisley uh, was one of the pieces I got, and it was just, it was not, it wasn't canon. Uh, That was made clear, but I loved it. It was so off the wall, loaded with the satire. The mm-hmm. story, I just in the artwork, I just loved it because I was always a fan of his art. Oh, that whole era of when Biz came in is just amazing. Yeah, and uh, and it, I never really got to read in my early years a full entire story. There mm-hmm. was no Necrop, even though Necrops was that they didn't send me. That. It was mainly just little single issues, like in the Day of Dread, like maybe four page, and it was broke up in like little four, five, six page stories. Well, sample, sample, just like what would it ever be in the day of life of Judge Dread? Mm-hmm. And I just like, man, this is some crazy shit, man. There's nothing <laughs> like this. And then of course that led on, of course, into Rogue Trooper and, and Slain, and uh, got me into the whole 2080 thing. But it, it it was really hard to come across 2080. Yeah. Or anything like that, that you know, uh, so but uh, I really felt in the past these past few years is really some of them been the best material they've been putting out on Dread. Yeah. I really love the new material, the stuff they've been putting out, catching what I can of it. Oh man, especially this uh, week we we're doing two different episodes with you and one of which is uh the judge pin saga which to me stands out as one of the best oh easily well you know i know we'll get there later but yeah i think definitely is a good time she's to, uh, the, one of the best villains in the last 15 years for dread yeah, absolutely. easily and that's what pushed me to digital because you guys uh, rick and hmk kept talking about it i was like i i want to read it but I, I gotta get it when it's done and like a trade paperback mm-hmm. and then hmk and i started doing this and i'm like 
I, okay, all right, all right. I give, I give, I give. So, I know when when uh, I first started hanging out with Rick, it was a while before we realized that we both liked Dread. It was like not something we had even discussed mm-hmm. in the beginning. Uh, but then there was definitely like a point where like I was talking about I don't I don't remember the ex- exactly what we were talking about, but I remember your response was like you like Dread, and you were kind of <laughs> like. Like, really like Dread? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's such a common, like, shock that we get as Dread fans when we find somebody else over here that knows Dread and likes Dread and isn't just aware of it from the Stallone movie. Yeah. Like, it's, oh, you you really like Dread. You you know this stuff. Holy crap. Well, it triggers, uh, what it is, Dread <clears throat> triggers an interest because, like, when we were at the restaurant, the movies does it. Whatever if it's the Stallone movie, the Carl Urban, that's always the limit to Dread. And and they'll say, oh, I like Dread. Oh, do you? You like Dread? Mm-hmm. I like the movie. Yeah. Oh. But it's never a book that people don't. Under- have- I said, have you read the books? No, I've never even knew there was a comic. Book. Yeah, it's it's a real deep dig to find somebody that's actually read the comic books. I know the first time, like the first couple times uh, you and I hung out at HMK, um, it was us talking, and you, oh, you you like Dread. Yeah. And then like you said, have you read Trifecta? And I said, oh, I haven't read Trifecta, but have you read? And I don't know. I brought something up, and then we. Oh, we actually know what we're talking about. So let's <laughs> let's go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, and maybe maybe the way we can get new people into dread is when we realize that they like the Sylvester Stallone film. Mm-hmm. We can say, oh, there's so much more. Yeah. There's even more. To maybe that. not be a dick about that. <laughs> it's really hard. It becomes a bridge doorway yeah. to it. Oh, right. if you like that, check out. It's really hard. This. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we resent it so much. Well, I've kind of flopped. I've changed my perspective. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah, it's not yeah, yeah. completely horrible. You would kill a dude for that Hammerstein robot. Oh no, I would. There's good. There's good things, but I resent the uh, the impact that it had. Yeah, it's it, it's definitely made an uphill struggle. It's very similar to Scream. Uh, yeah, we've talked about that too. Yeah, I, I like Scream as a as a horror fan. I like the movie, but the problem is after Scream came out, the idea of what was a yeah. horror movie. But you really can't hang that on Scream because it did it well and did bank and it just became the Xerox. It did. And it's the same it goes it's the same thing as hating Slayer because of the shirtless white trash dude that yells Slayer yeah. at every concert. You can't hate <laughs> the you can't hate the the creation. You just yeah. kind of hate what it what it spawns. It's, it's, it's progeny, yeah. yeah. What's I mean like Demolition Man is obviously a judge dread movie without yeah. the the uni. <laughs> yeah. And so I always bring that up. So you like Stallone Dread? Oh, you mean Demolition Man? Yeah. 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 Actually, Demolition Man's a very good movie. I like that yeah, movie. Actually, you never hear talked about. No, it, it's it definitely when it came out, it was big business, but it's definitely faded from reference and public um, knowledge. I mean, they reference the the fast food war. Yeah. Uh, they and maybe it's it's more of a we after we've been reading, especially we can say it's more of a Brink movie. Yeah, because they're getting fined constantly. Yeah, for it, def- it definitely does have that. <laughs> so, oh God, are we at the place where <laughs> Demolition Man stole from 2000 AD and, and now 2000 AD? If I find three fucking seashells <laughs> in a bathroom a on Brink, I am <laughs> I am gonna quit but reading it. 2000 AD just put a post up on their Instagram uh, for the next prog, and they're talking about Brink, and they did the censored and you're fined a dollar. Yeah. Oh wow. So. But so. with all the dread, like when you and I are together, we're talking dread. When Rick shows up to a show. We're talking slain. Oh yeah, and we are gonna get you. I guess I just gotta to, read one, right? Would you just read the Horn God, please? <laughs> you gotta start with the Horn God. I have so it. good. Rick, I, I Rick came it. to a show and goes, "These are all duplicates. I want you to have them." And I went, "Holy shit, this is awesome!" I went home that night, didn't even unpack my gear, and just sat there and yeah, reread slains that I haven't seen in a while. It was awesome. I sat there. I've done it twice. I, I sit in bed and I open it up, and uh, I get to the, about the part where. Uh, page two or three and I fall asleep. He is gone from us now. Boom. I fall asleep. You, you've you really got to start reading, try to read it when you're not tired. I know. I'm always tired. Sake, so. You're old. You know what the problem is now? You're old. I'm Well, I'm old and I'm reading every week <laughs> yeah. for this broadcast. So we're, what we're going to have to do is do a season where we deviate from Dread 100% and we do a, an, an episode per different thing. Rogue Trooper. Rogue Trooper. We need to do Stronium Dog. Yeah. We need to do slain. slain. Those are it's it's like the big four. Yeah, you know, and uh, this the it's just like thrash. This metal. bit thrash big dread four. is Metallica as much as I uh, hate to admit it, and uh, well, yeah, he's the most accessible. Yeah, he's the one that everybody knows. Who's an- well, no, wait, wouldn't dread put be out anthrax? a shitty put out a shitty thing in the nineties? Wouldn't dread be Anthrax though? 
Uh, he should be, but he's not. Okay, so Anthrax. Anthrax, Anthrax is probably like a rogue trooper. Okay, who's Strontium Dog? Uh, I'm gonna have to say Strontium Dog is Megadeth. Really? Yeah, because because when you think of Slain, you think of violence and blood and guts. So Slayer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I got you. Yeah. I got you. All right. All Could right. we get a a Slain T-shirt that in the Slayer font? Well, I could. I know a guy that can, can do that. Do stuff. that. Yeah. Oh hell yeah, I can do that stuff. That'd be awesome. <laughs> All right, so let's get into War Buzz. I don't have a Fleetway quality for this. I'm kind of oh, bad. man, what a shame. But Rick does have... Yeah, he, he's got... That's, he's reading in the Cold Wars. I guess I, it's time for Johnny Fact Check to check in. I'm also reading in the Cold Wars, and uh, it, it contains all of the story or many of the stories post-Apocalypse War that cover uh, our battle in Mega City versus the... The Sobs. The Sobs, yeah. The Sobs. So, right. uh, go ahead. Johnny Fact Check checking in. War Buds originally ran in Prague's uh, 2045 to 2049. It was five episodes over 30 pages. Script by John Wagner. Art by Dan Cornwell and Abigail Blummer. Ran from the 23rd of April 2017 to the 20th of September 2017. Yes. I got all that out. Good job. Hey, look at me. So, War Buds opens uh, with us. Visiting a private sanatorium. It's it starts off grim, man. It's man. It's it was it was a rough read for me because Dread is such a dick. Uh, yeah, I feel like Dread has a little realization of that at the end. I, I don't even know if I and I'm definitely one to call Dread a dick. A uh, we do that. A, we should have podcast. called this podcast Dread is a dick. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, in this one, uh, I I think it wasn't so much Dread being a dick as it was Dread going about his daily. Routine. He's called to the sanatorium, and they're asking him to sign off on this patient, mm. uh, who we end up finding out is uh, our man Costa. Costa. Mm-hmm. Costa was part of the Apocalypse Squad. Yeah, the, for the final push of the Apocalypse War. Yeah. He was the medic, I believe. Was yeah, he the yeah, he was a medic because he was, I think... Oh, was, that's right, because he talks about being a doctor, do yeah. no harm. Yeah, he's a, like almost like a conscientious objector. He doesn't want firearms, yeah. but he was there, and he, he's flipped out because he went against the Hippocratic Oath, and did a lot of harm. And or was yeah. at least party to doing a lot of harm. Most to save lives, not take lives. He assisted Dredd in dropping a fucking nuke on hundreds of babies. And the babies are what comes haunted. to him. Yeah, it comes he is to haunted him by the children and the innocent that he scor- helped scorch. And the, the thing about... This, I guess we, sh- we should have probably prefaced the Apocalypse War and explain... Yeah. Well, I always just feel like if you haven't read the Apocalypse War... Well, we're trying to bring Dread to the Dreadless, so we need to... No, no. I, well, what I mean, though, is what I'm saying is... I want to punch you. For the purpose of this, <laughs> I would say this. If you haven't read the Apocalypse War, know that this thing happened called the Apocalypse, Apocalypse War. War. And know that after the Apocalypse War, Dread created a second apocalypse <laughs> by nuking... A it's, running theme for Joe. It's Red Dawn. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's Dread Wolverines. Dawn. It's Dread, Dread Dawn. Dread Dawn. Oh shit. Yes. Dread Dawn. It's a good one. <laughs> so Dread no, I'm not saying if you haven't read the Apocalypse War, you're an asshole. I'm just saying if you haven't read it, no, there's a thing that happened called the Apocalypse War, and it's got to be pretty fucking hectic. Yeah, well, yeah the, the Sovs attack Mega City One through uh, subterfuge and sowing chaos, and they hit us with nukes, and then the finality of it is Dread fucking eye for an eyesum and he has this squad with him to do that final push yeah and if you and also for someone who hasn't read the apocalypse before reading war buds gives you a peek into all the little yeah. highlights you know and this is what 30 years removed yeah that's what apocalypse i was wondering war? like 30 yeah. years since it happened because that's still filling the effects from that it. was what 81 right 80 yeah. 81 for the apocalypse war mm. so yeah we're yeah. a long way down the line so one of the things that stood out to me for this was that when they talk to dread about you know we thought because of your involvement with this guy that you should be the one who signs off because they're they're debating on euthanizing him yeah uh and dread's response is i knew the guy for a couple days <laughs> damn you know, it joe despite the fact that they were involved <laughs> in nuking an entire yeah. you know an entire city together not just nuking but fighting their way to the controls to be able to push the button I knew him for like an hour. Yeah, for Dread, it was just part of part of the. Oh job. my God! It's yeah. it's Street Fighter the movie with Jean Claude Van Damme. Oh God! When Bison came to your village, it was a good day, a memorable day. But for me, it was, it was Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> Why do we both know that? Because <laughs> it's a great movie. <laughs> oh, but that yeah, I mean Joe's just doing his job, and that's mm, and and Joe. it shows that the the Justice Department breeds their judges to be machines. Yes. Yeah. So it was nothing to him. To everyone else involved, it was a life-shattering event, yeah. and Joe's just push the button, push the button. 
and he still feels justified, even at this point, even do, with all these years to reflect. Do you think reflect. he does? I think so. I, I didn't see anything in this prog that indicated that he felt that he shouldn't have done that. I did see something in this prog that indicated that he should have treated the Apocalypse Squad differently. Even in Guatemala, which is current right now, he, he says, e even if you launch nukes at us, a couple might get through. Yeah. We've done it before. <laughs> Jesus, Joe. Very nonchalant, <laughs> yeah. Fucking... Well, in the trade paperback, Cold Wars here, that's what most all these stories are about. War Buzz is just one of the stories. It's dealing with the aftermath because he's having encounters with the East Meg judges. He's mm -hmm. back there. He's still seeing the results from that. I bet he's that. real popular in East Meg. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a good trade paperback. It's uh, He's dealing with that. He also, uh, as he goes in to the asylum, and I work in mental health, I've said that before, uh, they are using uh, what I'm guessing is coming soon to a mental health facility <laughs> near you, which is a full body restraint yeah, chair. Yeah, he's just just pinioned up. He's not going anywhere. Now, we have a restraint chair at our hospital. Like this? Uh, not like this. You you strap there. I'm sure Rick has seen one, too. He also works in mental health. <laughs> They're not allowed to use them when we're at. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and in this case, I mean, my God, but it's like a full body exoskeleton. Yeah, he's just locked in. And we do get a peek into his mental state when we see his dreams mm -hmm. and it's nukes explosions and an army here i'm going to zoom in on it an of army melting of children melting children <laughs> and and uh he's, he just wants to tell them that he's sorry he doesn't want to live like this anymore no doesn't joe say that somewhere in uh there? but basically joe is told that the professionals at this sanatorium have all agreed that he's a hopeless case. Yeah. He's not going to be fixed. And the most humane thing to do is to sign the paper. Now, we don't even get to see whether or not he does. We find out later that he does, but it's such a non-event yeah. that Dredd it's just signed It's just paperwork, him. literally, for Joe. Yeah. Um, so, after he leaves, um, and presumably goes about his business, we're taken to a bar where yeah. we catch the up with the... The members. Yeah, the other members of the, the Apocalypse Squad. And uh, those are those are Mac, also known as McDonald, uh, Hamble, Kawan, I'm guessing is how you pronounce this guy's name, and Morant. Which one is uh, cybernetically altered? The, one uh, of them has bionic parts, right? I think that's Kawan. Yeah. I could be wrong. But we see that they've basically all had negative effects from their participation it's no longer street judges at this point they've all none of them took the walk but they're all just they were deemed uh they say later that they were actually deemed to not be a threat anymore so they were allowed, allowed back into society back into society not like yeah. kraken where he was just a uh, weapon and the cybernetic guy who i think is uh Kawan, i don't know the cybernetic guy the guy who's completely all you know just covered in metal he didn't even that didn't even happen to him in the apocalypse war that happened later yeah. on and so, mm -hmm. you know, you survive that only to go on to worse and worse be, things. Yeah. Welcome to the Meg. Yeah. Um, so they're they're kind of gathered at the local bar, and three of them are there. And then Morant, who is definitely the sort of outlier, who I, I think they've really just decided not to invite anymore. Yeah, he just kind of shows up. And yeah. Like, they're like, Anger uh, issues. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> he's, he's just freshly out of the cubes, too, mm. for those He's got a string. Issues. He's got a rap sheet, right? Yeah. And uh, he kind of shows up too, and Mac is in the in the middle of telling the other guys what's going on. You know, they're gonna mm -hmm. they're gonna euthanize Costa. You know, they told Mac when he went to visit that he was sort of a strain on the purse strings of Mega City. Yeah, he's he's an inconvenience now. Um, this, I mean, this is what we do to our own veterans today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and I like to think that maybe it's getting a little bit better uh, mm. since you know, Vietnam. And that's when we really started to focus in on how poorly returning vets were treated. But yeah. I have a cousin who comes from uh, desert storm and, uh, you know, he has Gulf war syndrome mm -hmm. and, uh, never really was helped by the VA in terms of psychological help. Yeah. And uh, he's never recovered, you know, and that, that's the war that we consider to be the one where nobody got hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's easy to care about them when it's all happening, but in the aftermath, oh well, they're they're still there, they're fine, no big deal, you know. But it's the scars you can't see that are, and this is a good representation of that. That are the ones that probably need the most help. What do you guys think about the idea? It covers a little bit in here that 
when it was over with, these guys all got out of the profession. And so they've sort of been living these just these lives that really have no direction, no purpose. Now there's just a normal Civ in, in Mega City 1, and, yeah. Yeah, they just can't integrate. Uh, whereas Dredd, Anderson, and Hershey all involved. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like being a shark. If you stop at any moment to let all of that, the impact of the... the the things that you've done come in on you, then that's when it starts to break yeah. you down. Maybe that's why Joe never stops. That that could be. Um, um, Anderson, I know. I'm well. I'm guessing that being the side judge, that she is dealing with a lot of trauma. I mean, you, we've seen how in her interactions with death take a lot out of her. Just yeah. interacting with that psychic entity that that powerful. So I'm sure she's carrying a lot around a lot of baggage. She might know how to deal with it the best out of. Her, have, Anderson, and Hershey. Yeah, because I mean, originally they were, uh, Hershey and Anderson was part of the Apocalypse Squad. They were in on that too. Yeah. But they survived. Dread even brings that up. And it's in the story. And yeah, so, yeah, that's right. And so, it, but I think it, they, they evolved like you were saying. They kept going. They kept for, uh, focus and purpose. Yeah. And having death in your head too, from Anderson's perspective. Yeah. That I don't know what kind of with you think I don't know. It's like does it give you perspective or make everything just seem completely meaningless? She does not seem to be a, as tortured as you might think. Yeah. So uh, maybe she's just psychically sound. And really, if someone should be tortured, it should be Anderson. I yeah. Mean, the, I mean, what she's she had seemed, on her. She might be the strongest of the three of them. Right. Yeah. I would expect to see Anderson in a in an institution, but like someday. She, yeah, but she's not so far. But Dread Dread is afraid of of stopping. Yeah, like it, even I know we did pin next week, but as Dread is there in the bed at the very end, uh, it's and it's in so many Dread stories, the crisis is over. He's in the <laughs> hospital and he's getting up and he's leaving. Yeah, and there and it's always Back to that work. way with Dread. Yeah. yeah, so so maybe he just can't stop because he knows that if he stops, he turns into Costa. Well, Dread's got a lot of weight on his shoulders. He's yeah. he's done some things. He don't live in the past. I don't him. think he can because, like, like uh, HMK said, that the past would crush him because he's done a lot of terrible shit. Yeah, in the name of law. So back to this uh, bar, which, by the way, is called uh, Problem Drinker. <laughs> the course. the Problem Drinker. Why not? <laughs> um, these these old fellas are sitting here and they're talking about the injustice of the system and how you know how they want to go and they want to save. The Costa. system's not helping Costa. Why aren't they trying? They they know they've mm -hmm. heard. That there might be some options in Texas, Texas City. Yeah, Mega Texas City. City yeah. So Morant shows up and they're basically saying, you know what? We gotta get the Apocalypse Squad back together. One last ride. We gotta bail we gotta bail Costa out. We gotta save Costa. So they have a, a purpose and a mission. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things in this kind of brought me back to that idea of moving forward and how they don't really put a lot of thought into... They put a lot of thought into the idea of saving Costa. But not the how. Yeah. And yeah. also, once they get to Costa, it even though the mission should probably be like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. we maybe shouldn't do this. Yeah. They continue forward because once you're back, you need something to keep you going. Mm -hmm. You know, again. So they start to formulate this plan to uh, break Costa out of... The asylum. Which seems, once they start in on it, seems to be going fine. They are all they all have their old judge uniforms on. It all looks above board and legitimate. They, don't, they seemingly have no problem getting into the asylum. No, it's it's not really heavily guarded because who cares about this old coot? Who yeah. cares about this guy? We do to get a little flashback to like when, City one. <laughs> when Dredd uh, gathered the Apocalypse Squad that I noticed uh, as they were heading in. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Kawan uh, is told talking to Anderson and she says don't you know he says I wonder where we're going so to d some degree not everybody involved with the Apocalypse Squad knew what they were signing up for right I wonder if that was that they know they might back out they just need to yeah uh, as needed basis you would think if you're going to nuke an entire city you would <laughs> at least get to opt out <laughs> but in the know. Justice Department you don't nope. you know Quan was a was a street judge, so he's he's going wherever. And then that you know, so you see him and Anderson talking about that. And then the next panel, he's blowing Asav's brains out. Yeah, like completely from the eyes up, just gone. Yeah. And th not that wasn't the last time they killed somebody that day. Right. That oh. was the least carnage he was going to see that day. It's only the beginning. 
But they, the Apocalypse Squad is preparing to go, and McDonald is adamant uh, that uh, he doesn't... Or, I'm sorry, uh, not McDonald. Uh, one of the members, whose name I can't remember anymore, is adamant that he does not want to take... Uh, firearms. He doesn't want to take any firearms, yeah. Um, so they, they 3D print some firearms. Yeah, because that's how you... Yeah, dummies. <laughs> When was it? When is this story written? Uh, it was 2017. Yeah, about okay. two years ago. Yeah, so I mean, they I, can print skin. Why they can't? Why I was can't just, they print dummies. Yeah, no, I was just wondering if they were predicting the future or <laughs> just commenting on what we can do now. So 2080 is an oracle. We yeah. <laughs> now they print their guns, so everything is fine. But we do find out here in a few pages that uh, Morant, being the ex-con that he is, he brings a real gun because reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, I mean, he, he's dealing with whatever it was that probably helped him survive the Apocalypse War. It's still in there, so mm-hmm. that that need to have he a, never a weapon came off the there. field. Yeah. So uh, he brings his own gun, and they head off to the asylum. It, it, with a ruse of some judges, and he's dressed as a doctor, mm-hmm. and they're gonna go in and see if they can. On, on the down low. Yeah. Like, it, it kind of turns into an A-team episode here. <laughs> <laughs> A standing for Apocalypse. See, there you go. Yeah. So, uh, they get there and everything seems to go fairly well uh, until one of the orderlies who brings out Judge Costa uh, questions why they're there. Just just very slightly. Oh, yeah. Maybe, I, I don't know, maybe I should talk to my boss. And Morit immediately goes towards violence. Mm, he doesn't yeah. shoot the guy, but he... He, he like, butt strikes him and yeah. puts him down. And they're like, oh, for fuck's sake, dude. Knocks all his teeth out. Yeah. And then, uh, so they get through that, and on their way out, as they're signing out uh, Costa, one of them goes to sign the paperwork and basically says, ah, oh, one less crazy for you to worry about. You know, don't worry yeah. about it. And she, she says, plenty more where that one came from. Yeah, so they're... For all intents and purposes right now, they they can get away with this. They can at least get out of the asylum before shit hits the fan. Much like uh, the current world that we live in, the uh, mentally ill and uh, the war torn are not highly valued. No, they're they're seen as a burden on the on the system. Yeah, uh, but as soon as they, this is where I was saying maybe this is the point where they should have realized their mission was not about Costa as much as it was about something they needed to do. Well, it, and it's too late for any reason to back out now. Yeah. But Costa, he's begging them to kill him from yeah. the get-go. Um, and uh, I think they're confronted with the reality. You know, as, mm-hmm. much as, as much as we could say Dread keeps going, they backed out. And so it's easy for someone who's not faced with this issue to say, well, you know, they shouldn't do that to these people. They shouldn't euthanize them. Not that I'm, uh, you know, pushing that people should be euthanized, but I'm just saying... When you're face to face with somebody begging you to kill them, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know you've come to kill me. Thank you, thank you. You've come to kill me because that's that's what where Costa do? is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He's he has been crushed by the burden of that day since that day. Yeah. And I think these guys aren't able to see that maybe in his case it's it is the humane action because they need some good thing to come out of all these. Years they need of to see that he can be saved to give themselves hope that they can be saved. Yeah. So that, I think at this point they're doing it. It's kind of selfish. Yeah. They're doing it more for their own salvation. Right? The cost is just yep. what they're pouring all their hopes into. Yeah, it's more the about vessel. them, more yeah. about them. And I was like, that's ultimately the way it is. People sometimes debt is better. Yeah. It, it, pet cemetery, you know, it's true. <laughs> Let but them. his mind is destroyed. I mean, yeah. when you see the opening of this, you're literally looking in the mind of Costa. Yeah. Imagine seeing this every day. Yeah, he, it's a movie he can't shut off. He cannot shut off. And when they get back to their the vehicle that they've commandeered or whatever. Yeah, they stole a delivery truck, right? I think they, they rented Oh, a that's right. They rent from... Because that from, comes into play from later. From Mega City 1 U-Haul. <laughs> yeah. As you will. Uh, they have a little altercation with Morant because they weren't supposed to bring guns. Yeah. So uh, McDonald Is it, says, "Isn't there a robot in here somewhere? There's, there's a, a there's a med droid in here somewhere. <laughs> there's a robot in here somewhere." But uh, Morant takes the gun and says, "We got to get rid of that," and he throws it in the storage. Yeah. Room. Well, then Costa's freaking out, 
asking people to kill him, and they say, listen... They lock him in a box. Well, they lock him in the same box. Yeah. Mm. That's their mistake, is that they lock him in the same box. They're so frazzled trying to get up and out before somebody realizes that they're not actual street judges anymore, and this is a, a bus, or um, an escape. And they, they mention that uh, they're taking him to Texas City to get psi surgery. Yeah. My thought was... And then when someone says, I saw it on, on the vid. Yeah. Uh, who who knows if this is like a like some sort of Phil Donahue like psychic search from the eighties? Yeah, is yeah. it is it something that is, even really exists, or is it just the idea of there's there could be something there's better? Hope. They yeah. don't want to do that final decision because, like I said, Costa is there. If they can save Costa, they can save themselves. Yeah. So it, it's not about him at this point. It's about the other the surviving members of the Apocalypse Squad mm-hmm. and their own salvation. And they're 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 busy sort of judging dread. For being the the horrible person that signed the order, yeah. But I also think uh, if we allow ourselves to see Dredd as a human being for two seconds, that uh, you know signing that order can't be easy. Although he sort of addresses that in the end. But if you were in that position and you had to make that tough decision, you know, and there are many people that have to make that decision. If somebody's on a ventilator, if somebody's yeah. on life support, uh, you know, Dredd's how- the guy to make that decision because. He's going to do it, and he's going to do his duty. Mm-hmm. Have either of you ever uh, thought about what what you would want? I have a DNR. Do you? You mm-hmm. currently have a DNR? Yep. Yeah. I don't want to be kept alive by machines unless I get robot eyes. <laughs> but no, no, I'm, I'm totally DNR. If I'm gone and I'm a vegetable, let me go, dude. You know, I struggle with that because I'm like... <laughs> I, we've talked about I'm this I'm like, before. what if I wake up? Yeah. I want that chance. I, I get... Uh, yeah. but, but I also... If I'm clinically brain dead, if I just... Pull it, dude. I'm stuck in a... I'm on the one video. Yeah. Just let me go. Yeah. Shoot I me mean, into space. Viking funeral me. I don't care. I, I think it when it comes... When when you really start to think of it, it who knows until you're in that scenario. And I got I, we're a lot closer to that than we are being cool and at parties in our teens. <laughs> I, I had to I had to type a death certificate at work last week. Did you really? I did. I had to recreate one. And I, I walked in, it's totally non sequitur. Um, my back was wrecked when I walked in the work Monday. Like, I had to leave early because it was just destroyed. So I'm sitting there and I'm feeling every year that I've aged plus double that. And right. I just feel awful. And I have to typeset this death certificate. And I'm like, I'm a lot closer to one of these than I am to being hopeful and exuberant and youthful anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Accidentally type your name. Whoops. Yeah. I just need you to fill this out for me so I can. <laughs> So uh, the Apocalypse Squad, they're they're putting on these ridiculous Texas City outfits. <laughs> I, I love it. I don't know what's going on here, but <laughs> we'll blend in. It'll be fine. They're they're on their way to the to the border. They're they're headed towards the wall. Yeah, the West Wall. And Dread gets the call that you know this has gone down. And don't again, they ID them as the uh, the members of his Apocalypse Squad? They don't necessarily. What happens is they get to the wall and they're being checked by security, and they basically say, "Oh, these guys are ex-judges." Yeah. And uh, well, this this judge here, uh, Morant, he's got he's got a lot of uh, issues. You know, he's got some some crimes on his uh, his rap sheet. His rap sheet. And that, they, that's kind of the thing about it. It wasn't very well thought out, <laughs> planned escape. It's like they were kind of. Resting on we we're former judges. They they've been out of action for all these years. Yeah, and they they didn't really plan we'll this out work. too well. Yeah, because they weren't acting like a very they weren't executing this as a apocalypse squad. I think they, they may were have... wrestling in the past. And we were we were these badasses at <laughs> one time, and they were so disorganized. Everything you, you, you had a one of them that was in put away, and he's a criminal. Now he's coming back, yeah. and then he's acting all emotional and violent. Yeah, he's the wild card. I think, he's the cause of trouble. I think when they went into the asylum, they were, okay, we're, we're going to do this. And he just wild carded it and wrecked everything. So yeah. now they're just, uh, 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 sombrero. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes back to them being in this sort of protective bubble when you think about, oh, I'm, I'm going to free this guy, and then you get the person and you realize he wants to be he wants you to kill him in there oh god i don't want to yeah and then it comes to the we still gotta save him yeah yeah it comes the time to escape and you think i didn't really think this through yeah we got yeah it was the idea of a four thousand dollar pinball machine yeah (laughs) i'm gonna do that i know you're gonna do that (laughs) so they're at the border and uh they ask morin about his history and he he has he actually has the best answer he says yeah well you know i'm a 
I'm an old judge, and when people talk about the Justice Department, it pisses me off. But I'm over yeah, that now. It, yeah, he does the oorah yeah, response. Yeah, and, and they oorah the fuck out of him. Yeah, they let, let him, him through. through. Yeah, that, so they've made it through the first gate, and now... They're out into the curse. They're, they're, they're headed into the cursed earth, because as they were leaving, some actual judges... Yeah, got they got the out right before the, the West Walls alerted right. that there's this, this rental van coming... And I like the fact that Mega City One paved a little bit out into the into the cursed earth. <laughs> we got to get out there. There's right. look, there's one coming in too. Yeah, and then there's a giant fuck you wall gun. Yes, in between those roads. And as they go through, the wall gun starts taking shots at yeah. them. And here we get to see the Dred's internal monologue, mm. and he basically says to himself, "He should have done more." He says, "You know, they, they." have at least the right to not be shot at while they're heading out because of their their previous yeah. sacrifice that they've given. So he calls off the guns and they say, "No, Dread, we're we're told that we have to take these people down no matter what." And he says, "I'm telling you, call off the fucking guns." Yeah. He, he calls them off. So at this point, Dread does not want to see bad things happen, but he's they've... trying to resolve it as best he can yeah. within the scope of his power and the letter of the law. And they, but the, the problem is they've already impersonated judges, yeah. which is they've known as jimping. Yeah, they've jimped. <laughs> Uh, they've they've assaulted someone. They've given false documents. They've absconded with a a, a convicted patient. Yeah, I guess it would be convicted because it doesn't. He was very much, you know, jailed up in that chair, and I'm sure he wasn't just in there for that one panel. Yeah, mm. and they're they're headed out to uh, to Texas City. What I try th- to make it to Texas. Yeah. Did you notice this? Rick and I were talking about this. What's how that? Dread flashes back to. A time when he did something very similar for Magruder. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Rick and I talked about that last night. Where instead of because they wanted to put basically put her down, yeah, and he couldn't have that. So yeah. he uh, and I, I think I asked you this last night. Did he knowingly do that for her to have her put down? Like in he took her. I thought he was. It was like her last ride. Yeah, and he he yeah. knew he took her into the scenario where she would die with her boots on. Ah, yes. yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. He, he wasn't trying to escape and get her. Medical help. No, nah, he was. Yeah, he was taking her out the way a judge would yeah. go, and that that was heartbreaking because Necropolis. Yeah. Uh, there's like the fourth time we've said it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. she is so instrumental in that, yeah. and that she is so she's such a strong character in that. And to see her, she's obviously in the grips of Alzheimer's, where she can't remember Joe's name, and he keeps reintroducing himself to her, and they ride out into this this conflict, and she goes yeah. down, but. I, yeah, and I think he realizes that that's a better way. They, the real way for a judge to go. Not and, and for whatever reason, Dredd had that connection with Magruder. They've been through all of this. Yeah. He doesn't necessarily have that for Costa, but he understands. He understands the situation. And I, and I think before when he signed the paperwork, that was not going through his mind. He didn't realize that. But, but in, the, in the moment now. What he says uh, during that interaction is, whatever their crimes, they'd been with him when it mattered. And then uh, the next panel, uh, they had to bear the burden of that act ever since. The annihilation of East Meg had left none of them untouched. And I... So that must mean both uh, also Hershey Anderson and Dredd. Uh, yes, because it emphasizes yeah. none of them untouched. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they deserve special consideration and leniency where he can show it. So he's going to let them get through and try to find a better way to stop the caravan. Yeah. And uh, this so, so this what, is by calling the... Yeah, what do you do? You call the rental company. <laughs> Apparently they can remote shut off. Yeah. And they do. They they remote shut off. And Dredd has this big, long flashback like we were talking with Magruder. And, uh, it's so heartbreaking. It is. And I think he's realized now that... Do you think he w- was concerned that he might also die in this thing? Because it's, it's like an actual bust. It's not a contrived scenario. Yeah, they're out there actually, mm. you know, taking care of some business in in the cursed earth. Yeah, Joe could have died out there. He could have. Yeah. yeah, it's possible. I think he wants to go with his boots on. Oh, well, definitely. You know, I mean, yeah. he, he there's no other. There's way. no other in for dread but them with his boots on. So the the hover car, whatever the fuck thing is that they're driving, uh, t- the the company takes over and it starts to turn back. Bring towards, it back to to Mega City. Towards Mega City, they start smashing the controls all together. Trying to put it down. And they crash the vehicle. Uh, very, very unheroic. Yeah. Uh, fumbling, you know, four old men fumbling on the inside of this vehicle. They crash it in the mega city uh, waste, like the outer outskirts, and Dredd sees it from afar. 
And uh, he says, do we have any med wagons in the area? They, they don't. And he says, well, get him here now because the crash looked bad. And he heads in. And uh, he is met with some carnage. McDonald has a fragment of metal through the chest. Yeah. He's, he's bleeding out, basically dying. We think he's dead at this point. I assumed he was done for. Yeah, certainly. Uh, Morant has a shard of glass in his head. And everybody's just really really fucked up but what they are not paying attention to is that costa, costa. is out yeah what happens rick he's meeting his fate but it you he, blow, he puts a shotgun into his mouth blows out his brains he finally has you can them. see the panel is really i mean his those voices oh he's got the, the faces in the background too. yeah they're screaming the voices in the in they're being silenced after all these years oh. of, of uh dealing with his trauma and hearing seeing his faces and voices it's ending for him Costa has no hesitation either. He, he he finally has the means to do what he's been begging for. Yeah. Yep. And at that point, you know, maybe the Apocalypse Squad did save Costa from, you know, who knows, 20 more years of They hell. saved Costa from his torment, but they in, in turn lost their hope. Yeah. Because they, they were trying to save him, like I said earlier. And Dredd rolls in to uh, assess the situation and Morant, says, you know, oh, it's our fearless leader. You know, what what would the Apocalypse Squad be without our leader? And he heads towards Dredd with the shotgun. Yeah. The very mm-hmm. shotgun that Costa blew his head off with. You think this is what Co- that Morant wanted the whole time, too? Uh, I think he's been looking for a way to go out. And this is, ob- this is yeah. with no al- illusion, this is suicide by cop. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think he heads towards Dredd. If you really look at the panels, uh, I don't know. I, I read it as suicide by cop. Oh, easily, yeah. He's not intending on trying to kill Dre. No, he wants out, but he he couldn't do what Costa did. Yeah. You know, Costa was hellbound on punching his ticket, but Morant also wants release, but he doesn't have that in him, as it were. Mm-hmm. And his last uh, uh, his last words, uh, this is, uh, I guess this is my apocalypse over and out. And uh, Dredd tries to tries to stop him. He but... bike cannons him. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he yeah, it, that was a really gruesome panel. Like the one thing I really struck me the the story is great. The art in this story is mm. phenomenal. Yeah, it's a good looking Dredd. And Dredd didn't want to do that to Morant, but he didn't know if Morant was gonna try to kill him. And yeah, it's it, that's total suicide by cop. So after the the dust settles, we have two members of the Apocalypse Squad still standing. Uh, it's and it's Hamble and Kawan, and Dread kind of gives us a list of of their crimes. Yeah, and essentially, it's they really didn't do anything that bad. They're they're looking at eighteen months and twelve months respectively. Respectively, yeah. yeah so. And Dredd drops a few things. He drops what he can. Yeah. Uh, I think he drops the impersonating a judge charge for Kawan because he was a judge. Yeah. And I think I think maybe in that point, Kawan was... He, he was acting as a judge. Yeah. He, he was he was trying to help The someone. last vestiges of his judge, his academy training. Yeah. And they ask him, you know, you signed the euthanasia order, and he says, why didn't you come to me about this? I could have done something to help... The euthanasia order was just a formality. He was yeah. just going about his business. It was part of the job. But he does admit that uh, he should have done more. He should have done better. Um, but at this point, you know, it's too late. Yeah. And I think you Joe, think he's got some regret. I think so. Yeah. I, not not about what he did during the uh, Apoc- apocalypse oh, war, no. but like what the scenario. Yeah. I, like he, like, he, <laughs> like you said, he didn't really put himself in their shoes. Yeah. Until he was on his lawmaster trying to track down the delivery van, then he did went back and remembered the, what he did for Magruder. Yeah, so he's may been she, there. Makes you rest. Makes you. <laughs> but makes you add. It's called war buds, but are they his war buds? They were definitely the war buds. Dread was. Yeah, he was. They were. The they were because you think it, uh, is are they his buddies? Well, you know? he said in the beginning, like I knew them for a day I knew or whatever. Them. Yeah, someone like Dread has hundreds of these same life-changing events every day he's, he's seen got a mexican be- birdman <laughs> i'm sure how do you live I'm on sure at some point he's seen the mexican birdman he's got to be compartmentalizing everything <laughs> yeah to, in order to survive as long as he has yeah so for for dread in this it, it just goes you know furthers the idea that these 
judges are all machines. Mm -hmm. Dread, especially being the prime example. Yeah. You know, well, he's the the he's, figurehead. And we've talked about that before. Yeah. Even in um, oh, what was it? We just I think it's in um, is it in Guatemala? No, it's in Penn. Where they talk about because he go, like, goes missing in Penn. Oh yeah. And uh, what's the new chief justice's name that took over for Hershey? Uh, Logan. Logan. He said, oh, "My first day on the watch," and he goes missing because they need that badge yeah. out on the streets because. Of all the things in the Justice Department, they fear that the most. I love Judge Logan. He's one of my favorites. Uh, I, I I hope he continues to be the the man that they're making him out to be because he's like he's a good chief judge. He I, seems so far. Yeah, I believe that change can come about under Judge Logan. He seems like an honest uh, and straightforward chief judge. Yeah, Judge Silver was mm, did some shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, Rick, what would you think of War Buds? Love it. It's, it's a really great heavy story. story. Really heavy story, and that's, and it, it, the last thing that he says, uh, what a what a I think he says something like what a sad end for the apocalypse. Yeah, squad. it's a dread feels the weight, and like I think I talked about this with you last night. You're not going to get this stuff in Batman or um, Superman or Wolverine. Yeah, or dread actually, you know, they they might have a special issue that deals with like a like that, but um, dread it's constant. Like there's even in Guatemala, there's heavy shit going yeah. on right now, and dread always ends up playing a part in it always comes back on dread's shoulder oh, it's yeah. always you know you he did what he had to do for the city mm -hmm. but at the same time he took these other seven or eight people took to hell. on the ride with him yeah. and now he has to go and deal with pick up the, 30 years later pick up the pieces yeah so it never stops just like we talked about when we read the samaritan yeah that psychic judge that he, or that psychic battery that he sort of created is now in oh his my head God. She's forever. Still out there. She's she's in his head forever, interacting with him as a piece of machinery. So, constant yeah. remind, chirping reminder of if, what happened. Yeah, and if if Costa had screaming babies in his head, what do you think Dread has in his? Oh, oh my God. God! Do you think the walls are gonna crack at some point? I'd like to see Judge Death jump into his head and, and then just tear it open. Well, and just see what was in there and lose check the his fuck mind. out. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm the inverse, what he did to me. Yeah, I can't work with this. There's nothing in here, but a little pea brain. Oh, <laughs> uh, is it time? It is time. That oh, was a good story. It, oh, oh. But that brings us to Bill time. Oh, goddamn! And uh, what is it this week? Well, I have a question for Whoa. you, Johnny. Oh, what? Uh, I'm just wondering here, as we talk about the effects, the long-term effects of things that can happen in your life. Sometimes uh -huh. things you don't even know that's happening under your nose, like this commercial, so to speak. <laughs> Do you care about your family, Johnny? <sighs> yes. Well, uh. have you ever stopped to consider how many toxins, carcinogens, and airborne pathogens are floating around in the air in the cursed earth? Well, it's 100%, I assume. Do you live in the cursed earth, Johnny? I just, I just commute. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I just commute. Well, I could bore you with facts and figures. And you're oh, gonna. I could bore you with statistics. No, mm. no, no, no. But it's like our pals at Sweet Air Ventilation Company like to say. You can't tell the diff until you... Take a sniff. You smell spaghetti sauce? Are you a thermostat dad, Johnny? I swear to grud, I smell spaghetti sauce. Well, saving money is important, but uh -huh. our friends at Sweet Air Ventilation Company want you to be an air filtration dad. It's even oh, more important, hmm. Johnny. Okay. So you could go ahead and call our protectors at Sweet Air Ventilation Company right now uh. and schedule their patented 15-point air purity evaluation. Or, I, uh, or, or, oh God, you could wait for your daughter to start to suffer the effects of Grubbs disease. What? Thus being known as the little mushroom girl at school. Oh, oh and I'm sure you're... you're uh, close to home today there. I'm sure your wife would greatly appreciate not having to suffer the embarrassment and humiliation of, of dropping dead at the next PTA meeting well, yeah. due to a case of Creeping Frank's disease. Oh, God, not Creeping Frank's. Yep. And you know what Creeping Frank's disease does? I have no idea. Creeps through your unfiltrated vents at oh, night. So you better properly fortify your home, you cheap bastard. Oh. <laughs> so don't take the cheap route. Put your money where your nose is. That's where I put And call my the flab specialists on. at Sweet Air Ventilation, and they will use their arsenal. Oh, get out! Of tricks to fortify your home, because at Sweet Air Ventilation, it only takes a sniff to tell the diff. Where's the coupon? So look up Sweet Air Ventilation Systems in your directory today and smell the difference. No coupon. I need you to read this. Oh, here uh, we go. Disclaimer. Ah, Jesus Murphy. All right. 
There is no statistical data to prove that either Grubbs disease or Creeping Frank's disease are transferred via airborne exposure. Sweet Air Ventilation Company acknowledges that upgrading your air filters has not been statistically proven to stop the spread of airborne pathogens. Sweet Air Ventilation filters are for cosmetic purposes only. Sweet Air Ventilation assumes no responsibility for death, disfigurement, or financial ruin as a result of using Sweet Air Ventilation filters. All right, so that brings us to the end of the episode and final thoughts about Warbuds, Judge Dredd in general. Rick, you've been our guest today and you will be our guest again for the Judge Pin episode. So on the tale of this story, what's going on? What do you think? Uh, it's it's a tragic story. Uh, uh, you've seen the fallout of what happened with the Apocalypse War and all these years, they're still dealing with it. Uh, I think with Dredd, it's building up that he's going to reap what he's sown more. I think we're seeing a change coming with uh, the system. A little bit more humanity. A little more humanity coming in with the the choice of the new uh, chief judge. And, of course, we know the end of what happened with Hershey. For those who have been keeping up with the new progs, I still have yet to read those, but I've been keeping up on it. There's a gold robot with a mustache. Yeah. I gotta read that. (laughs) So read War Buds. It's, uh, It's a... Heart gut wrenching story. I really liked it. Really, One of my you're, favorites. You're not going to get stuff like this in, in most other comic books, especially stuff that I like the major stuff that comes out over here. In this episode, I really thought, uh, I got to say it again, this was one instance where Dredd was not being a dick. Yeah, and I, I wanted him to be a I think I want him to be a dick now, yeah. but no, he, w- he did the best he could. And I think working with Dredd or alongside Dredd is a lot like being next to a hand grenade when it explodes. Mm. You're going to take some damage. Ooh. He was, yeah, he was going about his business when he came upon Costa. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think Dredd has ever prepared for any sort of emotional fallout. Yeah. But yeah, there it was. And. Oh, feelings. Just, yeah, just keeping his nose down and going about his duty, never giving it a second thought until he's now pursuing these old acquaintances Maybe. and seeing the destruction and realizing oh fuck wait oh. a minute other people don't just eat entire civilizations for breakfast no it's Oh, maybe other people have feelings, and I have a, a personal reference for how they might be feeling. Maybe I can dial that up. Yeah. It is nice to see Joe have to deal with human emotions instead of being, I am the law, all yeah. the time. And it's it, been a cool evolution of the character. It's the back and forth where you, you have some real terrible, terrible dick dread issues, and then you have some issues like this that it keeps you on that razor's edge of hating the character I don't think we ever hate him. Loving the character. Yeah, it's it's uh, he's a well written character. It's like being a heel in wrestling. Yeah. He is so well written to be. I think that's what they want us to. You that should be. I think the actual reaction to that character. Yes. Is, yes. Uh. Um, and the the people who have been writing Dread lately, and I of course there's always going to be complaints. I've seen them on the internet. Yeah. I, I really think Dread is in good hands. Uh, you know, even like he's always in good hands with Wagner. Oh yeah. But when he's not being written by Wagner, I I tend to really enjoy like we're getting ready to talk about the pin story oh, and so good uh you know the way that uh i think it's chris weston uh handled pin versus you know here you have something written by wagner and it's tried and true dread i feel like the same i feel like it seamlessly merges with what we see with the judge pin story so i think there's a good team of people who understand what what's going on yeah and what needs right to be now. done with the character and i don't know if wagner's telling them where he wants it to go or just he's i don't know if he's micromanaging it or just going okay here's the broad strokes mm-hmm. patch it in yeah I mean, whatever they're doing it's working and I, yeah. i'm really enjoying it yeah. yeah wagner is dread if you could actually make a real genuine honest movie he would have to play dread <laughs> he is the mind and soul of the character. he played miss tb grover though yeah <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that brings us to the end of the episode, but we will see you again very soon. Here, uh, signing out today is the three-piece. Three amigos. Uh, <laughs> Cursed Earth crew, the War Buds. My name's HMK. Cool Johnny Cool. Bring Biter 70. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Cursed, Cursed Earth Radio. Keep listening, creeps.